Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Tim Poe. I'm director of telehealth with the UNC Cancer Network at the UNC Lineberger Comprehensive Cancer Center. Thank you so much for being here today, October 23rd, 2019, for our medical and surgical oncology lecture. Just a few things to go over before we get started. If you're having any technical difficulty, please give us a call to 919-445-1000. You can email us at uncccn at unc.edu. We do have folks standing by who can help out. Um, other than that, you can find out a ton of information about us on the web, unccn.org. We're on YouTube and uh, Twitter and LinkedIn, uh, soon to be on View Medi as well. So lots of places you can find us, but the best place to start is unccn.org. Uh, we do offer free continuing education for all of our professional lectures, including this one. You can receive uh, free continuing education either for attending this live now or through our learning portal. And you can go to learn.unccn.org uh, anytime in the next year. Give us a couple of weeks to get this lecture posted and it will be available along with approximately 23 other lectures that, that uh, you can receive C -E CNE, ACPE, or ASRT credit for all 24 of those and CME for 12 of those, including this one today. Uh, what else can I tell you? We also have a, li a library with hundreds of lectures in that library. Uh, most of those are not available for credit anymore, but we do have hundreds of searchable lectures there. Uh, you can find us on YouTube, other places as well. We will be using Poll Everywhere today, and I really encourage you to take just a moment to get this set up. Uh, this gives you an opportunity to anonymously interact with our presenter, uh, share answers to uh, the questions he'll be asking, and then uh, provide your own questions at the end. So please be jotting down questions so that you can submit those at the end of the presentation. Two ways to do this. I think the easiest way is you go to Pollev dot com, P-O-L-L-E-V dot C-O-M forward slash U-N-C-C-N. You'll just see the questions pop up. You put in what you think is the best answer. You'll see that information appear uh, live on, on the screen. And, uh, if, and at the end, you can go ahead and put your own questions in, type those in any browser on a smartphone, tablet, computer, etc. If you would prefer to use a phone with texting capabilities for that, by all means, you can do that. In the To field, type in 22333. In the Message field, type in UNCCN. You'll get a reply back that you've joined, and then you can just uh, answer with the corresponding letters to the questions, and then at the very end, you'll be able to submit your own questions as well. So, uh, without further ado, uh, let me go ahead and change things up. And Dr. Shara, welcome. Thank you so Thanks much for, for being me. here today. Let's see what we know about you. Um, associate Professor and Associate Chair of the Department of Radiation Oncology at the University of North Carolina School of Medicine. And you're a graduate from uh, an MD from Medical University of South Carolina. Great. Yep. So far, so good? Yeah. Okay. Um, factual. Uh, leader of the Head and Neck Radiation Oncology Program at the University of North Carolina School of Medicine and a clinical trial specialist with clinical and academic expertise in the field of head and neck oncology and healthcare quality of improvement and patient safety and conducted three phase two clinical trials evaluating, evaluating D, um, intensive, um, excuse me, intensified chemo radiotherapy and pioneered the innovation of treating patients with a substantial reduction in both radiation and chemotherapy. And we look forward to maybe hearing a little bit sure. more about that, um, if not in the talk at the end. So uh, let's see how they did on that uh, Poll Everywhere question. So now that's live. So uh, if we could encourage our audience to go ahead and respond to that. Which of the following is, oh, I think that's the lot. Let me make sure. Oh. Sorry, I've got to do our uh, disclosures, and then I'll provide that one. This activity has been planned and implemented under the sole supervision of the course directors in association with the UNC Office of Continuing Professional Development. Dr. William Wood, MD, MPH, James Coghill, MD, CPD, staff have no, and staff have no relevant financial relationships with commercial interests as defined by the ACCME. Dr. Cherit is on an advisory board for Novaris and receives equity as compensation. He has no other relevant financial relationships with commercial interests as defined by the ACCME. And now we can get on to our live question. So which of the following is not a cause of, o of oropharyngeal cancer? A, heavy tobacco use. B, 
personal history of head and neck cancer, C, heavy alcohol use, and D, having been vaccinated for the human, uh, for the HPV virus. All right. How are they doing? I think the, the most incorrect answer is the being vaccinated with HPV. That should be protective. I think most of uh, the respondents are choosing the correct answer. Okay, good deal, good deal. So, and that's that's just to really just to get everyone uh, working with poll everywhere so that you'll be ready for the questions coming up. All right, so without further ado, let me pass the uh, keyboard and the mouse over to you. Yeah, that's right. Uh, thanks again for inviting me to be part of, to give a lecture for the UNC Telehealth program. I've done this once before, uh, a few years back, and uh, I really enjoyed the, uh, the, all the people who are online. It was surprising to see everyone who was online and, and interacting throughout the talk. Good. Well, we're glad to have you back. Yeah. Thank you. So I'm going to give a clinical trial update in uh, HPV-associated oropharynx cancer. Uh, my only relevant disclosure is that um, I do uh, am on the scientific advisory board, and I do have equity in a company called Navaris um, that is uh, has licensed the circling tumor HPV DNA uh, test uh, that we've developed here at UNC, and I will talk about some of the data we've generated you know, through multiple projects uh, studying that using that biomarker. These are the learning objectives, and this was on the flyer. So. Over the past couple of 15, 20 years, what we've seen is we've seen a dramatic change in the landscape of head and neck cancer. So traditionally, back, you know, back in the 80s, the 70s, the 60s, smoking was a major cause of cancer. But now smoking rates have gone down. And so what we're seeing here is that when, for HPV negative cancer rates, these are the ones caused by smoking, their incidences have been going down over the decades. But there's been a dramatic, almost epidemic increase in the number of patients with HPV-associated or pharynx cancer. And if you look at the total cases of head and neck cancer that occur every year, there's actually a slight increase in the total number of head and neck cancer, all comers, larynx, hypopharynx, oropharynx, oral cavity, that we're seeing uh, over time. And so what this graph is showing is that even though there's a drastically decline, drastic decline in tobacco-related head and neck cancers, there's been a rapid, almost exponential incline in the number of HPV-associated cancers, and this increase in HPV-associated cancer is offsetting the decline in um, tobacco-related head and neck cancer. We also know that patients with HPV-associated oropharynx cancer have better outcomes. Uh, this is probably the landmark paper. It was a subset analysis of an RTOG study that was answering a different question, actually. But when they looked at their 266 patients with HPV-positive head and neck cancer, sorry, 266 patients with oropharynx cancer patients, when they did their statistical analyses, which is called recursive partition analysis, what they were able to show is that the strongest prognostic factor was HPV status, HPV positive versus HPV negative. The next strongest prognostic factor was tobacco pack years, that being less than 10 pack years, smoking history to those being greater than 10. And then, then after that, it was nodal stage. So HPV was, it was, the, it was, the, was the strongest prognostic factor in predicting the outcome. And the second most important factor was smoking. And so when you look at when you look at the clinical risk factors of HPV status and smoking status, you're able to kind of divide patients into those who are going to do very well. These are, these are patients who have an, who have low risk uh, oropharynx cancer, and their three year old survival is 93 percent. Then there's patients who are intermediate risk. These are patients who are HPV positive who greater than, have greater than 10 pack years, or some HPV negative patients. And these patients are considered intermediate risk, and they have an, out, an outcome of three-year over survival of 71%. And then the HPV-negative patients have a, the worst prognosis of 50%. So it's HPV-related or pharyngeal carcinoma is an epidemic, but the, so the, the, the potential good news is that this is a very treatable cancer and very curable cancer. With this information of, of HPV being so prognostically important, the staging system has now changed. So with the change from the 7th to the 8th edition, the staging system has changed for HPV-associated and HPV-negative cancers. But what's pertinent to this lecture today is that now with the new staging system, the majority of patients with HPV-associated head and neck cancer are either stage 1 or stage 2. In the old system, before we used HPV as a, as a factor in staging, most of these patients were stage 3 or B or 4B, I'm going to say 4A in the old staging system. So they've changed the staging system to reflect the fact that patients with HPV-associated head and neck cancer do better, have a better outcome. So a lot has changed in the past two years with this new knowledge of, uh, of HPV-associated of, of HPV uh, head and neck cancer. 
I, I think that you know there are a couple of standard approaches to treating this cancer. I think the most common uh, standard treatment given that patients received is definitive chemoradiotherapy, and the the standard dose per fraction is two gray per day for 35 days over seven weeks. So the total dose is 70 gray. Most patients uh, get chemotherapy, and the standard classic chemotherapy is to receive cisplatin 100 milligrams per meter square times three cycles. And then three months post treatment, we'd get a PET CT to determine the response. And depending on the response, we then do a planned neck dissection or a biopsy at the primary site to assess for residual cancer. And so this has been the standard of care for many, 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 many decades. And the outcomes with this treatment are actually really good. The cancer control rates are really high. However, these patients suffer from a lot of symptoms, long term symptoms, and toxicities, and report that their quality of life is, is significantly affected by this standard chemo radiotherapy regimen. And so now, knowing that HPV cancers is an epidemic, knowing that the HPV orifice cancer patients do better, much better, and now finally re realizing that our standard of care treatments, standard of care intensity treatments cause a lot of side effects, there's now a great interest in studying de-intensified uh, treatment regimens. And there's basically, there are basically four major paradigms. And I'll go through these, some of the new clinical research trial data that's come out regarding these paradigms. So one paradigm is to give chemo first, then reduce the radiation based on the response to chemo. The other major paradigm is to not alter the radiation dose, but to reduce the intensity of the systemic agent. So give something that's kind of chemo light. And so this is where RTOG substituted cetuximab for cisplatin. The fourth major paradigm is to do surgery first. So to do newer transoral surgical techniques with the robot or the laser to remove the cancer and then do risk, pathological risk-based stratified adjuvant radiation and chemotherapy. At UNC, our approach has been a more simple one. We neither use induction chemotherapy or surgery, definitive surgery to reduce intensity. We simply have reduced the total amount of radiation and chemotherapy by reducing the total treatment time from seven to six weeks, from reducing radiation from 70 gray to 60 gray, and we're changing the cisplatin from high dose to low dose. So what's the rationale for induction chemo? Well, HPV-associated or oropharynx cancer does respond better to chemotherapy, and if we could look, give patients more chemo, can we reduce the radiation? Now, one could argue that's really not a, a there's, the trade-off there is really zero. There's a net gain of zero, meaning that you're maximally intensifying the chemotherapy and reducing the radiation therapy to an extent, but the overall intensity of the total treatment package is about the same. Another major um, reason for doing induction chemotherapy is that thought that induction chemotherapy may improve distant mic the, the control of distant mi micrometastatic disease, basically reduce the distant uh, metastatic rate. And there's been somewhat of a fallacy that's developed or, or a, mis a misinformation about the distant metastatic rate in HPV head and neck cancers versus HPV negative cancers. And the misinformation is that the distant met rate is higher in HPV associated or pharynx than HPV negative or pharynx. And that's it's actually not true. The distant metastasis rate, whether you're HPV positive or negative, is around 8 to 10 percent. So this is the first trial studying this approach of induction chemotherapy first. This is an ECOG study, and these patients, 80 patients, were enrolled. Uh, they were enrolled regardless of their smoking, smoking history. All patients received induction chemotherapy with a three-drug regimen. Then based on the response to induction chemotherapy, the radiation dose was reduced. So they assessed the response in the neck nodes and in the primary base of tongue tonsil area separately and those areas could get either 70 gray or 54 gray, depending on the response assessment in each individual site. So if you look at you know, how many people had a complete clinical response rate after, after chemotherapy, 70% had a complete response at the primary site, and 58% or 60% had a complete response at the middle site. So you could get 70 gray to the primary site and 54 gray to the neck and vice versa, or you could get 54 gray to both the primary site and the neck, depending on how you responded. There are a lot of pre protocol deviations in this, in this, in this uh, trial. 13 patients actually didn't get the assigned radiotherapy treatment. So if you look at the outcomes, if you look at all patients, all patients for the primary endpoint, the two-year progression-free survival was 78%, around 80%. All of the recurrences occurred in patients with greater than 10-pack years. So if you looked at subsets, 
If you look at you know, the patients who had the, the best outcomes were those who are non-smokers and who had, did not have T4 and 2C disease. If you had less than 10 pack years or never smoker or minimal smoker and had less than T4 and 2C disease, your two-year PFS was 95%. This is the next paradigm that we mentioned. This is the RTOG 1016 trial. Uh, also in Europe, a similar study was done called de-escalate. And in this paradigm, the total radiation dose has not changed. But the hypothesis was based off the Bonner trial, the Bonner data, that cetuximab is less toxic than cisplatin. So the de-intensification here is substituting cisplatin with cetuximab. And so in, the, in these two studies, what we learned was that 70 gram plus cetuximab is significantly inferior than 70 gram plus cisplatin at disease control and overall survival. And the toxicities are no different. The overall grade 3 toxicities are no different between 70 gram cetuximab and 70 gram plus cisplatin. So here's the RTOG primary endpoint Kaplan-Meier overall survival curve. The blue line here is the cisplatin plus 70 gram. The red line here is cetuximab plus 70 gram. And this is not what they expected. This is a non-inferiority trial. And though everyone was banking on the outcomes are going to be the same for overall survival. There's going to be less side effects with cetuximab. And now we have our new de-intensified standard of care regimen. And what they saw was the opposite, is that survival was, was there was a decrement in overall survival around 7 to 8%. And that from the de-escalate trial, what we learned, because their primary point was, was toxicity, that toxicity was no different. The de-escalate trial did report outcomes, and they showed a similar decrement in cancer control and overall survival in the semi-glyphosituximab. So this is a landmark trial. Yes, it did, but it did take us almost 15 years or almost 20 years to actually finally, you know, realize that cetuximab is inferior than cisplatin. I think many experts in the field had the sneaky suspicion that cetuximab was not as good as cisplatin. I know I did, and that the toxicity profile was similar. Um, this trial finally put the nail in the coffin for cetuximab. Now, it doesn't mean that cetuximab is a bad drug, but what it does mean is that you better have a very good reason not to give someone cisplatin if they have HPV positive or pharyngeal squamous carcinoma. They better have real reason not to give it. And if you're not going to give cisplatin, I think that cetuximab is a good second choice, but you really need to make sure that the patient is really um, ineligible for cisplatin before you make that decision. Cisplatin is still, even though it's a very, very, very old drug, it is the best drug in head and neck cancer to give with radiation. So we talked about surgery a little bit. You know, what's the benefit to surgery? Do surgery first. There's a small chance that you could do surgery alone and you can avoid postoperative radiation and chemotherapy. At the very least, you can do a pathological risk-based assessment and reduce radiation. Now, currently, the standard of care post-op radiation doses range from 60 to 66. So if you're treating someone definitively with 70 gray, you know, what is this 4 to 10 gray reduction going to get you you know, you're trading it off with doing a full op cancer operation, you know. So are you really de-intensifying? Again, what's the net gain here? I think we can't forget our historical literature. Neck dissections are morbid. And they are, there are toxicities, some moderate toxicities associated, associated with them. And there was one time in the, in the field of head and neck oncology where we tried to avoid neck dissections in favor of elective neck radiation. So ECOG 3311 is a, is, is, was a first study to open to answer this question. Patients are randomized um, after transoral resection to either observation, def, uh, and, uh, sorry, they're triage, not randomized. So based off, based off your surgery, you get risk stratified into low risk, intermediate risk, and high risk. If you're low risk, you're observed. If you're intermediate risk, you're randomized between uh, either RT only 50 gray or RT only 60 gray, and if you're high risk, you get standard of care 60 gray with chemo. This trial has close to accrual. I've been told that the, the results will come out in the next year, if not sooner. Uh, the only data I can show you is that when you see a patient in clinic and they say, I want to have surgery, what are my chances of avoiding radiation? It's only 11%. Only 11% of people in, these, in this trial were triaged to receive observation after surgery. So there's a good chance that you're going to have to, a patient's going to have to have radiation and or chemotherapy after a transoral uh, surgery. This study just came out. It's actually a randomized trial out of Canada and England. This is the Orator trial. It was uh, presented to ASCO and ASHRAE this year. Small study, around 70 patients. They randomized patients um, um, to either transoral laser surgery and then risk-adapted postoperative radiation and chemo versus definitive chemo radiation. The primary endpoint of the study was dysphagia at one year, okay? This study showed 
that the swallowing outcomes were actually better and the patients treated with definitive chemoradiotherapy, which was the opposite of what they hypothesized. It was actually better, their swallowing was better if you got definitive chemoradiotherapy versus having surgery and risk-adapted postoperative treatment. And so this, this is the best data we have right now. It's level one evidence, a small trial, but this suggests that doing definitive transoral surgery actually does not result in better quality of life and better swallowing outcomes. In this study, the cancer control was the same between the two arms. This is another trial uh, from one of my colleagues uh, in Mayo Clinic, Dan Ma. Mayo Clinic is a, is a bastion of excellence for surgery, definitive surgery for all head and neck cancer, and that's the paradigm. Everyone gets surgery, or the majority of them do. This was a single arm phase two, and what they did was is they everyone got transoral surgery and then they did a radical deintensification of the postoperative radiation dose. Depending on pathological risk features, you got 30 gray total dose at 1.5 gray per fraction BID with docetaxel or you got 36 gray in 1.8 gray per fraction BID with docetaxel. So the, the postop radiation dose went from the standard of 60 to 66 to 30 gray but with the caveat of BID fractionation and they used a very radio sensitizing chemo with docetaxel. They showed excellent outcomes. Their two-year local regional control was 96%, and that was their primary outcome. So this is some data saying that if you're going to do surgery, you know, you can go really low with the radiation with some caveats of twice-a-day radiation and the appropriate chemo selection. But when you compare this trial with the ORATA trial, what this tells me is that, or my, my you know, my, I surmise is that, you know, to really show that surgery can really result in a major meaningful deintensification and toxicity to patients, we're really going to have to really reduce our post-op radiation dose way below our standard of our standard post-op dose of 60. And you may be able to do that based on this Mayo trial. But doing definitive surgery followed by standard chemo radiation post-op doses is an inferior, possibly an inferior treatment uh, as compared to just straight up definitive chemo radiation. So. Getting to what we do at UNC, uh, over the past decade, uh, we've been studying a simplistic approach to deintensified chemoradiotherapy. So we deintensify by giving people 60 gray of radiation and low dose weekly cisplatin at 30 milligrams per meter squared. Our first proof of principle trial was uh, published in 2015. Uh, in, that, in that phase two study of 40 patients, we did deintensify chemoradiotherapy, but we required everyone to have a biopsy after treatment and the primary endpoint with pathological complete response rate. Um, the outcomes were excellent. The pathological complete response rate was 86%, and the cancer long-term cancer control was excellent at 100%. So after doing this first trial, we did a second trial, and this second trial, the whole purpose of this trial was to remove the surgical mandated biopsy, the mandated surgical biopsy. So patients who were eligible were T0 to T3, N0 to N2C, had oropharynx, unknown primaries, were P16 positive, minimal smoking history, they received the deintensified chemoradiotherapy regimen of 60 gray and weekly low dose cisplatin. But the things, the major changes we made compared to our first generation study was is that we went up, we used a three months post and PET CT to guide surgical evaluation. We omitted chemotherapy in early stage patients. We did allow some moderate smokers who had a remote history to be enrolled on the trial. Um, and uh, our primary endpoint was, uh, was now two-year progression-free survival. This is the schema. Again, uh, you know, you, patients were eligible. They all got definitive chemoradiation with a deintensified, reg deintensified regimen. Um, three months post treatment PET-CT was used to guide uh, whether we did a biopsy or neck dissection. So this is more of the standard approach that we normally do, right? We give chemoradiation therapy, we do a three-month post treatment PET-CT, and use that to guide whether we need to do surgery. So the results of this trial was recently published in the JCO. Uh, this came out a month or two ago, um, and so you can find it there. Well, 114 patients were enrolled. Uh, some key things here, uh, the majority of patients were never smokers or had less than 10 pack years. We did allow some, about, you know, we did have about 20% of patients who had greater than 10 pack year smoking history. Um, and uh, all of them received the definitive radiation dose, uh, and 78% received chemo. Here's the major outcome. So the primary endpoint was progression-free survival. Uh, we hypothesized that the progression-free survival would be 87%. We saw a progression-free survival of 86%, which met the primary endpoint, pre-specified pre endpoint. Low control, 96%. Regional control, 99%. 
Overall survival with 95%. So excellent outcomes with care in carefully selected patients with a simplistic de-intensified chemoradiotherapy regimen of 60 gray weekly cisplatin. You don't need surgery, neither do you need surgery nor induction uh, chemotherapy to de-intensify safely. Quality of life was excellent. You know, nothing's, nothing's without toxicity. Patients still reported dry mouth, but the key thing here with dry mouth is with 70 grade, there's usually no recovery after one month, okay? And our patients continue to show recovery after one month after 60 grade. So maybe there's more time to recover when you give one, week, one less week of radiation. I think the one remarkable, the, de definitely the most, you know, um, unarguable benefit for reduced radiation and chemo is that there was almost no effect on the patient's swallowing. Our patients reported that their swallowing basically returned to baseline quickly and, and, and stayed at baseline even long after in follow-up. So I think there's a ma major benefits in swallowing function with 60 gray versus 70. This is just pro-CTCA data mir mirroring the same thing that I, I showed you in the previous slide. So the UNC regimen, we started it, we we're pioneers in it, you know, we'll, we'll take credit for it. We, we did this back in starting in 2011. Um, NRG recently completed a phase two randomized trial in which they tested the UNC regimen, 60 gray, six weeks of radiation. Um, they did give cisplatin 40 instead of 30. They randomized patients to the UNC regimen versus accelerated radiation, 60 gray in five weeks. And um, this was a phase two randomized trial, so they really weren't able to compare the two arms against each other. So each arm was compared against, compared against the hypothesis that the PFS would be, uh, I think it was like 90, um, 91.5% or something like that. And so the takeaway home point, for here, point from this is that um, the chemoradiotherapy arm met the pre-specified endpoint and had excellent outcomes of 90.5% to your PFS. The RT only arm, it had respectable uh, PFS of 87.6%. But when I read between the lines here, it really shows that that weekly load, that weekly cisplatin matters in these patients. If you take this result in combination with RTOG 1016, which we show, where we show that cisplatin is better than cetuximab, and you look at this trial where they did RT only versus RT plus chemo, and now you can't compare them directly, but the fact that they are, their lines are not completely, you know, completely overlapping here, it suggests to me that, you know, these patients really benefit from at least some, a little bit of cisplatin when you give them radiation. So going forward, HN005 is currently open. Um, you can enroll patients on this trial. This is a phase two slash three randomized trial. The, 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 the decided upon standard of care arm for NRG head neck trials now is 70 gray accelerated plus cisplatin 100 times two. This is being compared to two... Um, uh, experimental arms, one is the UNC, regi uh, the UNC regimen of 60 gray, um, but they're not doing weekly cisplatin. They decided to go back to high-dose cisplatin 100 times through 2. And then the other randomized arm is 60 gray accelerated with immunotherapy. Um, so there's little permutations here, you know, with these two experimental arms, but the, the thought is, is that the, the phase 2 uh, part will go forward, which is open right now, and then the winner of the two experimental arms would proceed forward in a continuation of a phase three trial. Um, I won't make any more editorial comments about this, um, but we can talk offline. So our first poll question, what are the major deintensification paradigms? Transoral surgery followed by risk-adapted postoperative chemoradiotherapy, neoadjuvant chemotherapy followed by deintensified chemoradiotherapy, just simple deintensified chemoradiotherapy, A and C, or all of the above. All right, and uh, take just about another 10 seconds or so, if you would, to go ahead and uh, put what you feel will be the best answer for those of you using texting A, B, C, D, or E. All right, Dr. Shara, how are they doing? I almost 100% got it right. Great. <laughs> Great. Paying close attention. I promise I didn't make these questions hard. The next year, not hard either. All right. Well, we have a, we have a great audience that pay yeah. close attention. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So where are we at at UNC? Uh, so right now, our third generation trial, um, we're truly trying to personalize medicine um, um, and, and uh, allow more patients who have smoking histories to, to get de-intensified chemotherapy. So we, um, 
it, uh, eligible patients are P16 positive or experience cancer. This is our current trial that's open. Smoking status, the only people who are not eligible are people who are active smokers. So if you have a 50-pack year or 100-pack year smoking history, but you quit 20 years ago, you're eligible for this trial. We plan everybody on it. We start everybody on a course of de-intensified chemo radiotherapy. If you got more than 10 pack years, we sequence your tumor. And if you have a P53 mutation, which is known to be a bad prognostic factor in head and neck cancer, we give you a 10 gray boost and give you standard of gray 70 gray, standard of care 70 gray treatment. So we sequence the tumors in patients who have greater than 10 pack years and we try to personalize the treatment. We're trying to, trying to figure, ferret out the question, is it tobacco that caused your cancer or HPV? And so we think that if you have a P50 mutation, that suggests that tobacco is a bigger driver of your cancer, and we should not stop at 60. We should go to 70. And you still have the post-treatment PET-CT, which guides surgical evaluation. I'm going to talk about, um, and just going back, let me just go back. The other major part of this trial, and it's relevant to what we're going to talk about, is that we developed a novel circulating tumor biomarker that measures cell-free HPV DNA in the blood of patients. We developed it here at UNC. And when we, in, when we started this study back in 2016, we also started prospectively checking blood uh, for, of these patients pre-treatment, weekly during treatment, and with every follow-up visit for this biomarker. All right, so there's two biomarkers here in this, tri in this trial. There's the blood-based biomarker, and then there's the tissue-based biomarker for the sequencing. So for the sequencing part, you know, the trial really is looking at P53 mutations that driving, uh, the, you know, the intensity of treatment. But we were also sequencing a hand handful of other genes that we thought were interesting. And one of the, one of the stories I'm going to tell you is what we've learned about PIK3CA uh, from patients enrolled on this trial. So talking about the circulating tumor HPV DNA, um, with, a, with one of my collaborators, Dr. Gaurav Gupta, who's a physician scientist at UNC, um, we had a water cooler conversation and we had a discussion when I was opening up this trial and he's like, you know, I have the capability, I have the scientific capability of actually developing a blood test to measure circulating tumor HPV DNA and it'd be a perfect biomarker to study because it's only found in cancer, it should not be in the normal tissue. Um, if you have cancer, you'll see it, but if you don't have cancer, you shouldn't detect it. And so he developed this super sensitive specific uh, just, uh, blood test. It's a multi analyte digital PCR blood test. Um, it can, it's lower limited detection is five copies per ml in the blood. That's a lower limited detection. I mean, that is a very low limited detection, so it's very super sensitive. Um, it detects for other high risk subtypes besides 16. It also detects 18, 31, 33, and 35. So uh, we started, you know, using this, uh, this, uh, this blood test in this, in this trial. We found some, have some remarkable findings that I'd like to share with you. So first, first thing to validate with a blood test is, you know, how sensitive and specific is it? And so this is showing you that the specificity is 98% and the sensitivity is 89%. So what we did is, is that in 55 healthy college students who they gave their, they bathed their blood, you know, for, you know just for, uh, for study purposes. We don't have any of their clinical history. They're healthy volunteers, basically. And out of these 55 patients, this blood test was negative, except in three young females in their late 20s, early 30s. We detected circling term HPV DNA in these patients. Um, and, it, you know, our hypothesis is, is that they probably may have had a cervical infection or cervical, cervical dysplasia from HPV, and that's why we detected it. We also validated this uh, blood test in patients who had cancer but had non-HPV cancers. The majority of these patients are GI, patient, GI cancer patients and breast cancer patients. This is that green, this green box here. And we we didn't, we didn't, none of these patients had detectable HPV. We don't expect them to have HPV in their blood because they don't have HPV-driven cancers. And then, of course, we, we, we also validated this test in um, 103 uh, oropharynx cancer patients who we knew their HPV status, and uh, we were able to detect um, uh, uh, varying levels of HPV uh, in these patients. And all to all, all, all together, the uh, specificity and sensitivity of this, uh, this blood test is uh, 98% and 89%. I mentioned to you that during, in the trial that we checked this blood test weekly during treatment. Um, and so we studied the kinetics of how patients cleared this blood test uh, in, from their blood during treatment. And uh, this is some interesting data. And so the first thing I want to say is that, you know, when we, when we look at the patient's kinetics, so kinetics meaning this, that this is their this baseline mean, what is their, what is their CTHPDNA value during treatment, 
what is their peak value? And some people's peak value happens pre-treatment. Some people's peak value happens during treatment. And what happens after treatment? And what we're showing here is that patients have variable kinetics, but it's generally two patterns. One pattern is, is that you, know, you have detectable pre-treatment levels, but then like within the first couple of weeks, you spike. You, then you get your peak level of detectability in the blood. And then during treatment and after treatment, you clear. Another group of patients have their highest level that we detect is pre-treatment, and when they start treatment, they immediately start to exponentially clear, and by the end of treatment or thereabouts, they clear their circulating tumor HPV DNA. And when you look at clearance, uh, so this is uh, basically clearance or elimination here on the y-axis, and this is the weeks of radiation, you can see that people start to, some people clear very early, meaning they have undetectable levels very early. Um, I'll get back to this four, clearance at four weeks later because that's important. But you can see during a six to seven weeks of course of radiation, the majority of patients cleared their circulating tumor HPV DNA during their treatment. Now, this data right now I'm telling you is descriptive, but could it be prognostic? And I'll get to that next. So if you look at this week four time point, and the reason I bring up this week four time point is that there's data in nasopharynx cancer, which we know is caused by another virus, Epstein-Barr virus, Patients who clear their Epstein-Barr virus in their blood, meaning they have undetectable levels at week four radiation, have very good outcomes. So we looked at our patient data set. And so how many patients actually clear by week four? Um, and, you know, our definition of clearance is, is not, you know, 100% clearance. It's actually greater than 95. And the reason that it's not 100% is that our blood test is super sensitive, right? We can detect down to five copies. Um, and so we conservatively chose a cutoff of greater than 95% at week four. Um, and there are a certain number of patients who clear uh, that quickly um, here. It's around 20 to 30 percent. So what we did was is that we, um, we divided up patients in, into those who have favorable clearance kinetics or clearance profiles of circulating tumor HPV DNA and those who are unfavorable. And the ones who, are, who we define as favorable are those ones that clear at week four. Okay, so clearing out week four, we thought that we, that's a good that's a good clinical sign, and we wanted to see does that correlate with outcomes. So favorable clearance kinetics is you clear by week four, and, other, and those who don't have unfavorable clearance kinetics. And so when we look, when we look at this patient population and divide patients up based off traditional clinical risk factors, less than ten pack year smoking, less than T four. Most people say that those have those are those are low risk clinical factors. Those are those are low risk patients based off RTOG0129, the key and paper versus um, those patients who have high-risk clinical risk factors greater than 10 factors of T4, and you look at patients' clearance kinetics based just off their, cl their clinical risk factors. And if you look at their clearance kinetics, what's interesting here is that you have patients who have T4 disease greater than 10-pack years, but they clear their CTDNA by week four, and vice versa. You have patients who have less than 10-pack years and don't have T4 disease, but some of them have unfavorable clearance kinetics, and that's what I'm showing here in... in, in, in um, this uh, panel A. What about cancer recurrence? Does this, does this correlate with cancer recurrence? And so what I'm showing you here, here, each one of these bars is a, the number of patients who have cancer recurrence in the neck or distant recurrence, okay? And so here, these patients who have clinical low or high risk, meaning that, you know, they could have, the, the, there are some patients in this group here who have greater than 10-pack years or T4 disease. If they have a favorable clearance kinetics, there's no recurrence. In patients who have low clinical risk, meaning less than 10-pack years, less than T4 disease, but have unfavorable clearance kinetics, they have, there's a few patients who have recurrence. But the group that actually does the worst, and this is where I think that layering both clinical risk factors and circling tumor DNA clearance kinetics together, together can be a very strong prognostic, uh, prognostic uh, predictor, is in patients who have high-risk clinical disease, greater than 10-pack years, T4 disease, and if you have unfavorable clearance kinetics, you have a high, much higher significant uh, chance of having a cancer recurrence. And I show you this, the data in the same way here in this Kaplan-Meier curve. So this lower curve are patients who have an unfavorable CTHPV 16 DNA profile, unfavorable clearance kinetics, and high clinical risk factors, T4, grand 10 pack years. Those patients do the worst, okay? And maybe in those patients, we should not be deintensifying. The other important point to bring put out here is that there are patients who have who have more than 10 pack year smoking history but if they have a favorable clearance kinetic profile 
they actually do pretty well. And that is what I'm showing you here in this top blue line. There are patients in there here, in this blue line, who have any clinical risk factor, but if you have favorable clearance kinetics, you do well. So this is hypothesis generating. Maybe in that 50 packer smoker who quit 20 years ago, who's HPV associated, has HPV associated or interference cancer, maybe in the future we'll be able to offer them deintensified radiotherapy by monitoring their blood. And if they clear by week four, we can say, okay, you're going to stop at week six. We're not taking a week seven. So hypothesis generating, but that's where we're going to in the future here at UNC. And that's what I'm showing you here. Um, our next trial is going to be this use of clinical circulating tumor DNA as an integrate is as an integrated biomarker, integral biomarker, an integral biomarker in a prospective trial, where we will actually determine the intensity of treatment based off your clinical risk factors, T4, pack years, in addition to your clearance profile in the blood. Using those two pieces of information, we will stratify patients to different levels of intensity ranging from ultra deintensification of 54 gray to standard of career 70 gray. I think another very useful, um, one of the, another remarkable finding, and I think something that's going to be paradigm changing with the circulating tumor HPV DNA research we're doing here at UNC, is its usefulness in surveillance. So we know this epidemic, lots of patients are having this cancer, these patients are swelling our clinics, we're going to be managing these patients for many years. The cure rate's excellent, but if you look, but there's still about 10 to 20 percent of people who will recur. And these patients, HPV associated or advanced cancer patients, if they recur, they recur in unusual sites. It's not lung first recurrence, it's not neck first recurrence, it's not local site recurrence. Actually, they can have bone first recurrence, brain, liver, a soft tissue. The other thing that's unique about these patients is that when they do recur, they have better salvage out, outcomes, they have better outcomes of salvage treatment. They do better. If you look at a metastatic HPV positive patient, they do better than a metastatic HPV negative patient. So maybe if we could identify recurrences sooner, our salvage therapies would be more efficacious. So I talked about the use of circling term HPV DNA to dynamically monitor patients during treatment. We wanted to ask the question, can this blood test be used to monitor for disease recurrence in patients who have been already treated with curative, curative, uh, curative treatment? And remember, the sensitivity, sensitivity and specificity of this test is 90% and 98%. So what we did was is that we looked at a cohort of patients, 115 of them, who we had follow-up for and who had surveillance blood tests taken every six months. These are some of the same patients who are on our 1612 trial. This is, a, this is a case example of, of what we saw, of one case. But every case that I have seen has, made, has really been remarkable. So this is a patient uh, on trial, on, on one of our deintensification trials, and, you know, classic basic tongue cancer, P16 positive, less than 10 pack years. This is pretreatment. This is during chemoradiotherapy. These are his circling term HPV, HPV DNA levels. High pretreatment value, peaks during the first week of treatment, clears by week four or five. Okay, look like week five. Undetectable PET CT complete response, undetectable time PET CT. Okay, it becomes detectable in the blood uh, right around 270 days out. So less than a year out, we detect levels in, in the blood. I, I, at this point, I had become um, biased to this blood test. This was not the first patient that we detected early recurrence, and so. I got told, I, I started, I told Garab I need to know the results because I, I'm going to act differently now. And so we got the blood test and um, I couldn't get a PET CT scan approved, so I got a neck CT and a neck and a chest CT, negative, NED, right? So he continued, we continue to follow him. Again, he's positive, okay? Several hundred days, 150 days later. And I said, okay, it's still positive, two consecutive positive tests, I'm going to repeat a scan. I don't get a PET CT because it's hard to get PET CTs approved. Again, next CT, chest CT, NED. Then we come out here, he's almost two years out, and again, it's positive and it's rising. And at that point, I was like, you know, I, 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 we have to get a PET scan. Let's, let's, let's do the peer-to-peer. -peer. Let's get it. We get a PET scan. He's got oligometastatic disease in his pelvis. Give the patient a radiosurgery uh, for salvage. 
So these are kind of uh, this is one this is one uh, case, um, but there but you know of the twelve patients that were occurred on this trial, um, on this study, this is this is what we're seeing that this blood test can detect recurrence much sooner than I can than the clinician can. Um, so if you look at, you know, the performance of this blood test and surveillance, if you look at patients who um, had a negative value after treatment, these are, this is what this graph shows, if you have a negative undetectable CTHPVDNA value in your blood after treatment, the negative predictive value of this test is 100%. That means that none of these 87 patients recurred. 100% negative predictive value. For patients who had positive blood tests, we saw something interesting. If you have a single positive blood test, the positive predictive value of, of one positive blood test is only 54%. If you have two consecutive positive blood tests, the positive predictive value is 94%. So what is happening? We're seeing that some patients, they'll have after treatment, they'll be undetectable, they'll have a blip in a detectable level, and then will spontaneously clear with the next blood draw. And that suggests something of some kind of immunosurveillance going on. For the patients who are undetectable after treatment, become detectable once and then twice, that's a, that, 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 that is a very strong indicator that there is occult metastatic disease uh, that needs to be found. This is showing you that uh, the, the, set, the, the survival rate for patients, this is recurrence-free survival. This is not overall survival. If you look at patients who have negative, negative blood test, none of them get a recurrence. But patients who have two positive blood tests, almost all of them will be discovered to have recurrent disease. This is a, just a graph showing you lead time. So what I have here is time zero is a time of biopsy proven recurrence in the metastatic setting or recurrent setting. Uh, the, the red dots show you the time the blood test becomes positive. And in almost all of these patients, the blood test is positive before we actually clinically diagnose the patient. Um, uh, and in this patient, what happened was is that this, you know, if we had checked the blood again before the biopsy, I bet it would have been positive. It's just that, you know, getting access to patients' uh, blood samples, um, you know, when they're coming back to clinic, sometimes you can't get enough uh, blood tests done. So I think the future is going to be something like this, where after three months post treatment PET CT, we will no longer do fiber optic in office fiber optic examinations. We will no longer do routine imaging. We will do blood tests to measure circling tumor HPV DNA in the blood. Should a patient develop two positive blood tests, then we would do a fiber optic examination and order a PET CT. And I think that the, there's this is a this is a this is a value based pro, this is this is a, there's a lot of value for the patient and for our healthcare system and for payers. So for the patient, you know, more accurate, more precise, earlier detection of recurrence. Also, some anxiety relief from knowing that you have a negative blood test. The ease of surveillance with the blood test, patients like to have blood tests, are easier to do, the easier to, admit, uh, to obtain and to uh, analyze, less invasive, lower costs to the healthcare system and to the patient and to payers, because we're not going to be doing in-office fiber optic examinations and we won't be doing routine imaging. All right, second poll, and we're running out of time, <laughs> so I apologize. Which of the following statements about plasma circulating tumor HPV DNA are true? Sensitivity is 90% for this blood test. Specificity is 98%. The negative predictive value in surveillance setting equals 100%, or all of the above. All right, getting lots of responses in. We'll take just a few more seconds. Uh, if you haven't had a chance to respond, please go ahead and do that. How are they doing? Doing good. Good. All the answers are correct. So um, all of the above would be the correct selection. The sensitivity is 90%, the specificity is 98%, and the negative predictive value in the surveillance setting is 100%. Great. Well done. Thank you. All right, real quick, pick 3 ca um, So uh, I told you that we were doing sequencing on our trial, looking for P53 mutations. A serendipitous finding that we have discovered is that pic 3 ca mutations is an adverse prognostic factor in HPV-associated oropharynx cancer. And I'm going to kind of go quickly through this, and I, I'm sorry that I've been uh, um, verbose today. Um, so just for, for background, you know, um, HPV oropharynx cancer uh, compared to HPV-negative cancer, the number of mutations is far less than HPV-positive cancer. You don't see a lot of mutations in HPV-positive head and neck cancer, but in HPV-negative, you see a lot more in the tobacco-driven one. 
The one mutation that you can see, and the one that's most prevalent, and it occurs in around 20 to 30 percent HPV or various cancers, is a mutation in PIK3CA. But it's unclear if PIK3CA mutations affect outcomes in oropharynx cancer patients. And so uh, what we have shown um, in our data, and this paper is going to come out in the JNCI, is that when we look at a cohort of around um, 80, almost 80 patients who got sequenced, 77 patients who got sequenced in our trials, patients who had a PIK3CA mutation, and all these patients got de-intensified chemoradiotherapy. Patients who had a pic 3 ca mutation who got de-intensified chemotherapy had a higher, had a worse disease-free sur survival, disease-free survival, meaning they had more cancer recurrence than patients who had wild-type pic 3 ca okay? Now, this is hypothesis generating, but it's very interesting. We don't see very mutations in HPV or pharynx cancer, but if you do see one, it's most likely going to be a pic 3 ca mutation. And our data suggests... Early, this early data suggests that it may be a prognostic factor, a bad prognostic factor. This is a paper done in Pittsburgh, a similar study to what we did. But the key difference here is that all patients in this trial had trimodality therapy. In a way, they got escalated. These were HPV-associated or cancer patients. All of them had surgery and then adjuvant chemoradiotherapy in the majority of patients. Okay? And they also sought to answer the same question, does pic 3 ca mutations portend a poor prognosis? And in this paper, they showed that it, did, it was a prognostic in this, in this group of patients treated with trauma and therapy. They didn't show, they didn't observe that if you had a mutation, you did worse than if you did not. Now, how do we interpret this data in light of the data I just showed you from UNC? It's very interesting. In this paper, patients were intensified. These were HPV positive headache cancer patients that got trauma and therapy. In our data set, our patients were de-intensified. They got 60 grain in weekly cysts. So what this, this is starting to suggest is that we can maybe further personalize medicine, and maybe in the future through multiple validation studies, that when a patient comes into your clinic, you get the HPV status from the tissue, you got the squamous cell histology, you would also get the circling tumor HPV DNA during treatment, and you would also get the PIK3CA mutation status before treatment. And you would use all of this information to help personalize medicine. It may be that if you have a pic 3 ca mutation, we should not be de-intensifying in you. We should be intensifying pay treatment in these patients. But we need to validate that, and we have plans to do that. All right, final question. Patients with HPV-associated oropharynx cancer who had pic 3 ca mutations and were treated with de-intensified chemoradiotherapy had worse disease-free survival, true or false? All right, and again, take just a few more seconds. Go ahead and put in your response, Dr. Shara. Yeah, so um, I showed you two data sets conflicting. Uh, one saying pic 3 ca mutation is not a bad prognostic factor, one that did. The one that showed that it was a bad prognostic factor was the patients who got de-intensified chemoradiotherapy. So the answer is A. Lots of people think. Um, I want to thank you know, the university, I want to thank the medical school, uh, I want to thank the Cancer Center uh, for supporting all the wonderful work we're able to do here at UNC with clinical trials and research in the lab, in the clinic. Thank uh, Dr. Um, Eric, who's the Cancer Center Director, Dr. Marks, all of the funds that come from UCRF, from Leinberger, my colleagues, uh, Dr. Gupta, uh, Dr. Kumar, the clinical trial coordinators, our patients, physicians, uh, the multidisciplinary team, our surgeons. Um, our affiliates across the state who have enrolled many patients on de-intensified trials, uh, Dr. Nate Sheets um, and my colleagues at the University of Florida who have uh, been mentors and uh, have, have uh, co-enrolled many patients in all these trials. Again, I want to thank our patients uh, and I want to thank uh, the UNC Telehealth team for organizing this. It's a lot of work, um, but it's, a, it's definitely a worthwhile endeavor. Well, we're happy to do it. And with that, let me go ahead and uh, open things up for some questions. So, uh, bear with me for just a second. There we go. Um, 
So questions, you can go ahead and submit your questions, and we do have a few minutes to do that. And while we're waiting for those questions to come in, uh, I, I, this has been fascinating, and I have a, a few to, to start with. Um, you mentioned that you had difficulty getting that, that PET approved for that patient with the first one and then the two uh, high HPV circulating DNA blood tests. Is, is that getting easier uh, since that time, or do you expect that to get easier in the near future, especially when you get that second positive? Yeah, so um, currently, currently without, mm -hmm. well, you know, currently it's getting harder and harder to get PET CTs peer, right, peer reviewed. Right. So, you know, the future, you know, um, value to the payer also for, mm -hmm. to, to get them to agree to the PET CT and say, hey, we're not going to order all these other scans and we're not going to do fiber optic scopes. Mm -hmm. So if you cover this blood test, mm -hmm. which is more accurate, mm -hmm. you know, we'll be, we'll be more judicious of what we order. And when we order it, you don't need to fight us on it. Right. You know, right. You know it won't be it won't be that we're just willy nilly ordering a, a, a PET CT. Sure. We have a good sure. reason to. And strong yeah. justification. Yeah. Great. All right. We've got other questions rolling in. Uh, what was the association of HPV and OPSCC serendipity, or was that serendipity, or was it hypothesized being studied years before? Um, <laughs> So in the 90s, you know, you know, so HPV was discovered like in the 60s and 70s, and then its cause, causality with cervical cancer was like the 70s and 80s, um, and then the causality with anal cancer was studied more, and then in the 90s, people started, you know, um, <clears throat> started noticing that uh, there was, you know, an increased risk of, there's a lot of, was rising incidence of oropharynx cancer, and so in Europe, they did a lot of uh, cohort studies looking at viral antibodies and things. And so it, it was it wasn't serendipity. I think it was it, it was um, you know what what the what you know what the clinicians saw the changing landscape of the type of disease they were seeing, um, and uh, you know people knew that HPV could infect the oral the, the oral pharynx and oral cavity. I think it was a, a natural step by step progression of science. Great. Uh, what is the percentage of non smokers that get a cure after salvage? So, you know, I tell patients 90%. I tell them I can never tell you 100. Mm -hmm. um, it's probably 90 to 95%, but there are non-smokers who recur, and I've seen it. Um, and maybe the PIK3CA will help us even manage those patients. You know, maybe if you're a non-smoker with PIK3CA mutation, we shouldn't de-intensify. And also circling tumor HPV DNA, even in the non-smoker, maybe it'll be useful in helping us decide on how to intensify or tailor therapy. Okay. Are you doing uh, DNA testing outside of clini the clinical trial here at UNC, and is insurance paying for this? Um, we do not do it outside of clinical trial, because if we do, um, our RRB wouldn't be happy about that, because we, we can send everyone else to do the blood test. Um, insurance has currently not, has not covered it. it the, the blood test has been licensed by a commercial entity, and it's going to be commercially available in January 2021. Great. Right. Uh, did you see any improvements in patients' ability to taste food over time with the reduction of the radiation dose? You know, we've collected all that quality of life data. Um, I'm gonna, I, and you, from that question, I'm going to get a resident to look into that. Um, by, my bias is yes, they have better taste, but we have the data, so we should look at it. And so that's a great question. Great. We'll have to have you back to tell us about that. Uh, is there a role for uh, antiviral therapy to maintain the HPV levels uh, low and prevent it, to keep them low and prevent recurrence? Yeah, not, not, not you know, antiviral therapy in the traditional sense, mm -hmm. like valcyclovir or HIV drugs. Mm -hmm. Really, we need, to, we need to get people vaccinated. That's the mm -hmm. antiviral therapy that we need to, um, and it's a public health issue. Please get your young children vaccinated. I think the FDA, CDC and the FDA now have approved vaccination up to the year. Even four, young 40-year-olds can get vaccinated. Um, please get vaccinated. Yeah. All right. Have you seen a difference between the cisplatin 20 or 30 versus 40 uh, weekly dosage? I mean, there's some very small, like, phase two, trial, phase two randomized trials mm -hmm. comparing 30 versus 40 or 30 versus something else. And they're mm -hmm. poorly designed trials, you know, so I don't look to them too much. Um, <clears throat> as far as toxicity goes... I think 30 is more tolerable. As far as efficacy, efficacy, uh, efficacy goes, I think the efficacy is the same. Okay. We've got just time for a couple more questions. We'll take the last ones that are up there. Uh, percentage of patients requiring G-tube feeding during UNC trial of deintensification? So our, our G-tube rate is 40%. With standard of care, it's, it's like 80%. So there's a lot mm -hmm. less G-tube. And, no right. and no one has a permanent G-tube. Great. 
All right. Is there data on the CTHBB DNA uh, and other cervical HBB related malignancies? And are the results similar? We have um, there. Some people have studied it. Um, what I would say is that they've studied in small numbers, and their diagnostic test is nowhere. Their performance, their diagnostic test performance is nowhere near ours. We currently have a, a, a trial open here with the Gynonc uh, with cervical dysplasia. We have two collaborations with, with another academic institution looking at anal cancer and cervical. So we'll have that data out. And that sounds like a great lead into our last question. If a patient has a diagnosis of HPV cervical cancer and had a hysterectomy only. Does she have a risk for HPV head and neck cancer? Um, it depends on what kind of hysterectomy you have. I think this question is getting out whether the cervix is still intact. Um, yeah, I mean, I think she is, they are at a higher risk. There are some uh, population-based studies showing that women with HPV cervical cancer have a higher, higher uh, occurrence of, or chance of getting a, a, a metachronous HPV or pharynx. So if her, if her cervix is intact, then she, uh, yes, we need to surveil her more carefully. All right, and I do apologize, but we do need to, to go ahead and wrap up. Uh, we have uh, more lectures, always, tobacco use, uh, treatment and cancer care. That's coming up on November 13th, and cancer and pregnancy coming up on November 27th. We hope you'll join us for both of those. Uh, we also have uh, self-paced courses, so some of our previous live courses are now online. Best Tabasco 2019 and Cardiotoxicity and New Therapies. Both of those are now on. I mentioned we have about 24 different lectures freely available for uh, online credit at any given time. In our Cancer Conversation th series uh, this Friday, October 25th, Living with Breast Cancer with Dr. Gallagher, and then November 22nd, uh, Vaping Cigarettes and Tobacco Use uh, with Laurel Sisler. So we hope you will be able to attend both of those as well. Reminder, those are not for credit. Uh, finally, thank you so much. We appreciate you being here each and every time. It's been great to have you once again. Uh, you know where to find us on the web. Uh, thanks to our hardworking team, uh, and that includes Mary King, Veneranda Obore, and John Powell. Thank you to the, the General Assembly of North Carolina for all of their support of Lineberger and uh, the, the Comprehensive Cancer Center and uh, the, that support through UCRF. All right, Dr. Sharon, thank, thank you. you. We really appreciate yeah. it. This has been great. Have a good day, everyone. All right, we'll see you next time.